Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The Psychology of Better Call Saul. Today I'm going to talk more about Kim Wexler and her ever-present anxiety. The plan is to look at her behaviors which help curb her anxiety while also understanding the multiple forces that are driving her anxiety. With that being said, let's get into the analysis. In episode one, we find Kim in the Mexican restaurant with one of her clients. Kim has become obsessive about work at this point. She is practically living at that restaurant, meeting clients at all times of the day. These aren't the acts of a regular hard-working lawyer. They are that of a compulsively driven workaholic. We're seeing someone in constant need of stimulation and action. Not only is she constantly seeing clients, she's also ordering way more food than she ever needs, jumping from topic to topic, playing with items in her hands, and cycling through inner thoughts. By the ways she is speaking, moving, and presenting overall, you would think that she was high on speed. But in actuality, it's just the underlying anxiety that's propelling her. She can't confront the deeper issues about her life and where it's headed, so she needs constant distractions as a way to ignore and push forward. She never has a chance to reflect on herself and objectively view her behaviors as her mind is always active and never at rest. Then in episode two, Jimmy gets the call from the Kettlemans and everything is going to plan. But Kim seems uncertain and she is seen in the background gripping her pen and asking if Jimmy will give them the stick. For Jimmy, the whole stunt on Howard is not so important, but for Kim, it's like life or death. When she realizes that Jimmy is going with the soft approach, she is confronted with the fact that it might not go according to her plan. So to Jimmy's confusion, Kim states that she'll come along for the trip. As an anxious person often does, they must ensure plans go exactly as they wish so as to maintain control in their lives, attempting to decrease the chance of unwelcome deviations. After their conversation, Kim continues typing on her keyboard, most likely working until all hours of the morning like the addict she is. In episode three, Kim sees Suzanne at the courthouse and submits some legal documents to her. Suzanne is shocked by the fact that Kim would submit these documents to her, not only since it took great effort on Kim's part, but also since it was a cooperative act. But we understand how this act is actually aimed at curbing Kim's anxiety in two separate ways. For one, it justifies long work hours and overextending herself, actions which keep her distracted and busy. And two, it aids Kim in her attempt to believe that she is the most ethical lawyer. As I discussed in my previous video on Kim, her reaction formation is full blown at this point. Due to her being married to a scam man like Jimmy, being involved in criminal activities and wasting away her promising career, her attempts at being the most wholesome lawyer serve to defend against the anxiety that these deeper realizations might create. Her profession has become the antithesis to what the rest of her life looks like. This is further confirmed when she soon talks to Suzanne about Lalo and pleads ignorance to knowing anything about him. Although she just delivered the documents to Suzanne like she was supposed to do, Kim declines to do the other thing she is supposed to do by being truthful about Lalo. She is doing her best to block from consciousness anything that conflicts with the ideal she has created about herself. As a cherry on top, she soon begins defending Jimmy from disparaging comments previously made by Suzanne. Kim is always working to quiet internal strife, while real ethical responsibilities are secondary concerns. In episode 5, we see Kim up in the middle of the night and she goes to the living room to smoke a cigarette. She is nervous about Lalo and his potential comeback, but we notice that the room is littered with beer bottles and that Kim has now started to smoke inside the home. This is a huge regression on Kim's part. In the past, she was always diligent about smoking outdoors, regardless of the location, but she is now failing to put the same care into this act as she once did. The increase in smoking and alcohol use indicate a need to suppress inner feelings of turmoil, more forms of distraction and numbing in her life. These changes also track with the devolution into a more destructive type lifestyle for both of them. 
one in which future plans for growth and development are mostly left outside the equation, while temporary short-term pleasures dominate. Kim has always relied on massive hits of dopamine in order to cope with life, but at present time, these strategies are taking center stage. Later in the episode, she meets with her former associate Viola at her part-time office, a Mexican restaurant. Once again, we see Kim gripping her pen, rubbing her mouth, and thinking about her next move, resembling a junkie looking for their next hit. We soon learn that Kim is digging for more information and using her unassuming and innocent friend for her own personal gain. She is always on edge and ready to pounce on her next opportunity to progress the Howard scheme. And we see the function the prank serves, similar to her excessive smoking, overworking, and need for constant stimulation. She has become addicted to these types of behaviors as they provide her a high, while also helping to curb the constantly nagging feeling that something is terribly wrong and rotten in her life. Then in episode six, we get to the core of Kim's anxieties in the scene of her as a child in the department store. Our first image of Kim shows her tapping her foot, something she still does to this day, informing us of her long-standing feelings of worry and restlessness. She's a person who is always uncertain of what will happen next, a result of her mother's unstable and unpredictable lifestyle. When Miss Wexler first arrives, it seems like the actress picked to play this part is failing in her role. But we soon find that the character is putting on a show and presenting a false personality to the store owner. This informs us that Kim was raised by, and therefore constantly absorbing, a caretaker who was often incongruent in her interactions with the world. Kim continually observed a person who acts one way with people while revealing her true feelings when no one is looking. This must have been very confusing and disorienting for Kim, as she was often unsure of what was genuine emotion and care and what might be false. We can imagine that Kim was just wanting her mother to notice her in this scene, a sort of attention-seeking behavior that develops when children have inattentive or otherwise preoccupied parents. And since mother is into fashion and jewelry, why not steal a necklace? Miss Wexler is provided the chance to pay attention and be a good enough mother to Kim in this scene. She could perhaps try to find out why Kim took the necklace, have a discussion about why stealing might be wrong, or even just comfort Kim for being in a potentially scary situation. But instead, she approves of Kim's actions and gives her the necklace as a reward. Mother is messaging to her that it is okay to steal, and that engaging in these types of behaviors will give you the validation that you were seeking. And like any child who is faced with this dilemma, they will side with what keeps mother happy and what leads to the least friction in the family dynamic. This scene helps to illustrate how Kim's false sense of self has been formed. Even though she may know deep down inside that certain types of behaviors might be wrong and contradictory to her potential values, the false self created via relationship with mom is telling her the opposite. It says that stealing and tricking others is valid and permissible. Ultimately, the anxiety she is always looking to run away from is caused by her true self and the way it is opposed to the false self. There is another part of Kim, the kid who played in band or the adult who genuinely wants to help others that is being silenced. The voice that is heard is that of the false self because that is what mother approved. Kim was provided little to no encouragement to develop her own sense of right and wrong to seek internal validations not based on the opinion of others, to develop herself as an independent person, so she can't trust her true self because it was not provided the chance to come to life. If we look back to season five real quick, to the scene when Kim proposes to marry Jimmy, we can see the ways that her relationship with Jimmy mirrors that of the one with her mother. In both situations, she is needing to lie to herself about her own version of reality and instead commit to the other person in order to maintain the validation she so desperately needs, the way of the false self. 
In both instances, she changes herself so as to incorporate the other person who is a bad fit for her life. During these processes, she lies about what is real to both herself and the other person, which helps maintain stability of the relationship by confirming the other's delusional life, the false self again. But the long-term impact is that she unconsciously knows that everything is not right, resulting in her persistent anxiety. Unfortunately for Kim, the moment before she proposes to Jimmy is the last time we see any authenticity from her, her true self. Her real emotions peek through as she is about to leave Jimmy and revolt against his ridiculous lifestyle. But at the last moment, the fear and anxiety about losing Jimmy and being alone sets in and she looks to elongate their relationship something she most likely did with her mother on numerous occasions, once again a function of the false self. Returning back to the end of episode 6, after Kim is informed of the hiccups in their prank on Howard, she turns the car around and we receive a great bookend to this episode. Kim rejects the job that is best for her and her career, and instead moves towards the prank which will provide her the validation and attention that she has been seeking since childhood. She needs to try and crush her constant unease about herself by completing the stunt, as opposed to doing the thing which is best for her in the long run. But like many cases of this kind, the behaviors one engages in to stop anxiety in the short term are diametrically opposed to what might relieve anxiety in the long run. She rejects the path of building her self-confidence, working towards long-term goals, and becoming more independently minded. All activities that would be in line with her true self and would help to overcome her lifetime anxiety. She instead chooses the false self's path of short-term pleasure seeking, only leading to temporary relief, engaging in activities that need to be repeated over and over again. The solutions Kim has found to deal with anxiety are also what expound her anxiety to greater levels, leaving her trapped in the uneasy life of the false self. This has been another episode of The Psychology of Better Call Saul. One more video coming up. This one's on Mike. Thanks for watching.